Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here, and um, I'm pleased to, uh, to be able to stand here and talk about genetics. I'm a human geneticist uh, by training, but most of the work that, um, that, w that, that I do in, in my lab is related to uh, brain-related diseases. And I can tell you that brain-related diseases are somewhat different from Dupuytren's. Uh, nevertheless, there is some overlap in the approaches and the, the things they've learned from another can be applied to, to the other as well. Uh, this morning, we also heard about how beautiful Groningen is. I, uh, even though I'm Dutch, I, I don't live in Groningen, and I live in Los Angeles, and I can say that Los Angeles is great too. Uh, <laughs> the weather is really good. <laughs> And I, I work in this beautiful building, by the way, the Gonda building, at, uh, on the campus, uh, the medical uh, uh, campus at uh, UCLA. So the, uh, today's topic for me is uh, human genetic study, uh, studies of Dupuytren's, and it's really an introduction. So I, I will, it will be light, I hope. It will be easy to digest after um, a meal. Uh, it's an introduction to lead in uh, the other talks that will follow after me, and they will speak about uh, real things. So I will just sketch a framework of genetics and hope you have some um, appreciation of it afterwards. Uh, we'll see. Uh, if I ask people about what the, um, what the definition of uh, genetics is, of human genetics is. I remember as a student, uh, uh, a professor of bi um, uh, biochemistry said, well, genetics is not, not it's just a toolbox, that's all. And I thought, well, that's not really, it's more derogative than really complementary, uh, complement to the field. But yeah, if you think about it, toolboxes are really good if you apply them really well. So even though it's, it was not meant as a compliment, I, I take it as, a, as a, uh, a way to go. There indeed are tools that we can apply to study human genetics. Another conversation I had some years later was with a cell biologist who said, well, genetics is just a, yeah, doing a little test here and there, some statistics, and you have a p-value. What's the value of that? And I study cells, and that really tells me something about the biology. And well, of course, uh, that is also not a very positive uh, approach to genetics. And um, I hope I can show you that there is value to genetic studies. And, uh, um, let me just first define the word and then go over the reasons why I think it's valuable. First of all, the definition, you can get it from Wikipedia very easily. The definition is that human genetics studies is a scientific approach to study inheritance. It's very simple. And it also means that genetics is generational, from one generation to another. It's very principle to genetics itself. So by itself, it's not a new thing. Even Plato, uh, some um, years ago, 400 BC, talked about um, careful selection of spouses to produce uh, beautiful children. And even though we may um, uh, not like the idea and see, well, that is politically incorrect, he observed the fact that there is generational features from parents to children, and he did not know anything else about it, but he observed it very well. And so, Genetics in itself is not a new thing. But what is new, of course, in today's world, that we know a lot more about the origin of genetics, which is the DNA. And um, as I mentioned before, that most of the work that we do is related to brain-related diseases, in particular, schizophrenia. And, uh, the, and the principle, the way I approach it, the principle of human genetics is very simple. There is genetic variation, and we want to understand which of these genetic variants lead to or contribute to a disease phenotype. And that is, we talk about here causation. What is causing what is resulting in a disease? What is increasing the, the disease risk? And of course, there's a lot bet between DNA variation and the disease itself. This morning, it was already mentioned that there's a difference between flu and influenza, or the flu and, uh, and fever. And so there might be aspects of the disease that are secondary consequences and not me causing the disease. But as soon as we talk about the connection with DNA or genetic variants and the phenotype, we talk about causation. And that's really what we, what we want to emphasize here. And whether or not we study schizophrenia or Dupuytren's, it doesn't make a big difference necessarily. The principle remains the same. The focus of genetic studies is to study disease causation. 
And why is it so important? Well, this morning we had a nice discussion about cell biology or the ECM, very important. I would argue that if you identify the genetic variants or those genes that are implicated, that you have causal evidence for, and you can study those in the context of an ECM, then you can find the answers that are relevant for the disease. And also, hopefully, uh, more, in a more targeted fashion, develop tools to treat the disease, diagnose and treat it really well. So disease causation and the principle of genotype to phenotype is critical. But let's just foc focus on those two elements, the phenotype and the genotype, the genetics and the, and the clinical aspect. Because there's no genetic study, human genetic study, without a proper definition of the phenotype. And for schizophrenia, it's really difficult because you need questionnaires, you need someone to observe it and describe it very carefully. Dupuytrens is great. As I already mentioned, the first talk this morning, that it was very simple to diagnose. But other questions we need to know too. That what is the instance? How often does it happen? Are there gender differences? What is the age of onset? Uh, are there environmental risk factors? And of course, we know all these things for, to some degree. What is the difference in disease severity? Some people are more or less affected. Or are there, is there comorbidity with other phenotypes? And those things are critically important when we do a genetic study. But the biggest question, of course, is, is it heritable to begin with? Do we have prior evidence that genes are involved in a disease? And um, that is, a, of course, a very important question. And if I highlight a few papers from the last few years um, that show that genetics is important, 2005 was a linkage study in a family from Sweden. A locus was identified with, with sufficient evidence of involvement for, the, for Dupuytrens, a large pedigree. But it's the only linkage finding thus far. It shows that there is evidence for uh, single gene variants or Mendelian forms of the disease, um, even though we don't know the mutation yet of this particular uh, family. Uh, last year, there was a publication in, uh, in the twin sample from uh, Denmark, a very elegantly um, large study, a population-based study. That's very important, by the way, for this sort of thing, a population-based study. There's no bias necessarily uh, with the selection of individuals, even though there's always a bias in diagnosis. But it showed the heritability of Dupuytrens was roughly 80% and a population incidence of 0.6%. And another study was done by Hans and his group uh, showing a correlation between the disease severity and the family history. And all these things point to, and very firmly point to, a genetic, cor a genetic factors are involved in the disease. And of course, we did this study a few years ago, uh, the genome-wide association study that was usually successful from my perspective, not because I was part of it, but because um, even in a relatively small sample size for genetic studies, we, had then, we were able to identify nine different loci, nine different uh, locations in the genome. And that is unheard of for any other complex uh, uh, trait that we study. For schizophrenia, we would have needed 20,000 cases. Here, it's less than 1,000 that were already sufficient to discover these things. So that's showing that genetics is not just and playing a role, but playing a critical role in, in Dupuytrens. But if you think about genetics by itself, uh, it is important to you know, define a few things. First of all, alleles. We talk about alleles. These are genetic variants. And today you will hear about SNPs, SNP, single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, as depicted in the picture on the upper right there. A single location can be an A, G, or T, or C, and that's a, we call it an SNP variant, a single nucleotide uh, variant. And these variants can be very common, can be very rare. On average, they happen one in a thousand uh, or one in 600 nucleotides in the genome. So they don't happen too often, but they happen frequently enough to have a, a million or so or more in your genome. Uh, so they are common and they can, they can be rare. They, some of these variants are shared with many of us in the room and others uh, are unique to you and to your family. Uh, another aspect of an allele or genetic variant is whether or not it plays a role in a disease. And some of the variants play a huge role, and others uh, almost nothing, or, or, or nothing at all, or a tiny bit. So the effect size, what we call. And if you think about the common and rare variants, this is a paper published in 2012, in which they sequenced uh, 200 or so genes uh, that were involved in, in a drug study in 14,000 people. And above the line, the zero line here, let me see if I can point it out here. Here, the zero there, the line, are all the common variants. 
MAF is the minor allele frequency. So everything above half a percent is called common, so it can be 1%, can be 50%, but all the variants that are common are on the top there, and at the bottom are the rare ones listed by gene. And it's very obvious, there's an iceberg. Only the top that we can see are the common ones, and the rare ones are underwater, it seems here. In other words, there are a lot more rare variants in the genome that are unique to you and your family than common variants that are shared. And if you think about it for a moment, and genetics plays a role in disease, do you think that common variants explain most of it or rare variants? Well, simply the fact that rare variants are so common, <laughs> are so frequently uh, occurring in the genome, it must be that rare variants also play a role, isn't it? But thus far, most of the studies have focused on the common variants only. If you play out these two elements, allele frequency and effect size on the disease, you, you can plot it in this diagram. There's rare and common, small effect, big effect. And if you have a rare allele, that it has a huge if effect of dis on disease or a phenotype, you end up with a pedigree. And you can do Mendelian types of studies, and it's very obvious. But most of the variants that have been studied for complex traits are more in this corner, are the common ones, because that's how, what technology allows us to do. And those are not found in pedigrees or inherited in the same way, and the design of the study ends up to be a case control. Just for your information here, just imagine you're studying a rare allele that has a very small effect size on the disease. Well, as a scientist, you're unlucky because, first of all, it's hard to find, and once you've found it, it's hard to prove it's involved in the disease. So this corner is the unlucky corner. This corner there, it's hard to explain how that will work. Something that's very common and has a big impact on the phenotype. Uh, in other words, everybody has it. So it's not called a disease anymore. But those, those two principles of allele frequency and effect size are just therefore very important. And if you go back to the GWAS study, it shows here the, the nine loci that were identified at the time and the allele frequency of the, of the allele implicated in the disease. And you can see this is all very common. And I can predict that many of us in this room will carry these alleles, or at least a few of these alleles, uh, predisposing to deeper trends. And yet we may or may not have uh, deeper trends itself. So common alleles play a role. But if you go back to the data itself, the GWAS, the, you can also do some predictions and say, well, if I look at this data, can I explain how much of the phenotypic variation is explained by the genetic variation that we see? And the genetic variations are these SNPs, these common variants. And then the, when we do some math, we can show that of the significant ones, they explain roughly 1% of the heritability. Well, we know for the other study that the heritability is roughly 80%. So the, the significant ones explain a very tiny bit. If you look at all the SNP variants in, the, in this study that was done uh, with Paul and others, then it explains roughly 14% of the heritability, the common variants. And if I do another, app, another tool to identify what the heritability is that is explained by these common variants, it's roughly the same number, 16%. So common variants will explain us a lot about duper trends, but it's up to a point. It doesn't explain at all. So the question then remains, uh, what rare variants do? And I already tried to explain to you that rare variants, you end up in pedigrees if you're lucky. Uh, but pedigrees are hard to find. This is an example of a pedigree that Paul has collected and we did some work on. We did a linkage study, we did some exome sequencing. But you can already see that it's very hard to obtain multiple generations because trans is a late onset disease, isn't it? So the number of uh, individuals that are affected in multiple generations is limited. And this is one of the larger ones here. And if rare variants play a role, you would uh, su supposedly find those and identify those in families with trends. So we did a linkage study in six uh, pedigrees, um, of which are 32 affected individuals, and there was no evidence, there was no evidence that um, um, of a major locus. We did not find a single location that was shared among these families or that was pointing within each of these families with sufficient evidence of an involvement in the disease. And that means that there is no, these are all Dutch families, by the way, there's in Holland, therefore, there is no major locus explaining dupertrans, no major gene explaining dupertrans uh, in families, even though it might be observed in families. And um, it was somewhat disappointing, you can say, 
uh, but then we decided, okay, if we have these pedigrees, um, maybe they're too small because you need, you need a lot more of these affected individuals in the multiple generations to identify anything. So let's do sequencing. Uh, so it's a little bit a different approach. We took uh, two or three affected individuals per family and we sequenced all of the coding uh, uh, regions in the genome, most of the coding, it's called exome sequencing. So you can sequence all the, uh, um, assay all the genes at once. And just ask the question, do I see rare variants or not? Do I see rare variants in this pedigree that fit um, a pattern of inheritance and may cause the disease? And then you have to ask the question, well, do I expect to find variants that have never been described before? Now, we focused on those. We focused on variants that were never reported in the literature, assuming that if you, that this was rare and uniquely causing Dupuytrens. But of course, if you think about it for a moment, Dupuytrens is not killing anybody. It is, um, uh, it may be more common than we think it is. So even rare coding variants may not be as rare uh, and it may, be, may have been reported before. But we focused on the, on the rare ones now. And we, so we, we searched for the unique deleterious variants. But, and, and we found four of those in two different families. So one family contained three different unique var coding variants that were predicted to be deleterious. And all three, even though they were located in different parts of the genome, all three of them fitted this particular pattern of inheritance in the whole pedigree. So we cannot distinguish one from another what is causing uh, Dupuytrens. However, one of the three is one of the genes highlighted in the GWAS. So that might be a link there that we need to pursue further. We don't know how, how that will play out. In the other, uh, other family, we found one mutation that was uh, co-segregating uh, with the Dupuytrens. So the question remains, are rare variants involved in the disease? So I've tried to explain to you that if you think about genetics, there are different approaches. That in, for Dupuytrens, even though the phenotype is relatively easy to, to assess, that there's still the question about allele frequency, common and uh, rare ones, and the effect size of, of, uh, of these alleles. So if I, if I s summarize what I've said thus far is this, that Dupuytren, in general, can be considered a heritable trait. There's no doubt. It's a heritable trait. Yet it's complex, and environmental factors play a role too, but genetics and genetic variation explain some of the disease too. The genetic studies of Dupuytrens, and hopefully we'll hear more today, have been very promising and very successful. It's exciting to see how the field is moving forward. And I think it will point to causal genes, causal variants that can be assayed in these the functional studies as well. And what is also exciting that the findings thus far point to a single or, or, or a few pathways, let's say the wind signaling pathway is one of those. And that is also an, an important thing for many other studies for complex traits. It, the story is not so clear. Dupuytren is one of the success stories in genetics, even though it's not so appreciated in the field at large. If you think about common alleles, yeah, they explain up to, let's say, 20, 25% of the heritability. So we should pursue those. And I think today we'll hear more about larger studies that will identify more variants. But I think we need even larger studies to cover even more ground. It's relatively easy, it's relatively simple and straightforward to do so. So I would encourage you to, to seek out uh, collaborations and, 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 uh, and collect more uh, samples, blood samples or saliva samples for DNA studies. The current studies only can explain roughly 1% of the heritability, so there's a lot more to be discovered. If you think about the rare variants, first of all, the vast majority of genetic variation in your genome and in the patient's genome is rare, unique to that patient, unique to that population, unique to, that, to his family. And Mendelian forms of the disease may exist. We have these families, but they are selected. I'm not sure how, um, how it will survive or, or, or when we do more studies, because if we select a family, it fits a Mendelian pattern. It may not be Mendelian after all. We've seen the same thing in studies for schizophrenia, for example. So they may exist. No, our efforts thus far have show no evidence for a major locus. And um, I would say that if we want to move forward on this as aspect too on rare variants, the collection of familial cases and families, if possible, is also necessary. 